This is a Nobody's Radio Station exclusive presentation. All right, everybody, it's Chad Vice. <laughs> and have I got some news for you. Welcome to the Nobody's or Somebody's Podcast or Nobody's Radio Station Heavy Rock Radio. If you're listening to this conversation, I'm about to bring to you from Dave Russell, singer from the band April 16th, a British based uh, new wave of British heavy metal rock band from the uh, mid 80s till the early 90s. We get into the whole band history. But like I said, I've got some news for you. Turn that phone off. Turn your phones off. I got some news for you. Um, if you haven't been aware, if you're not aware, I finally joined TikTok. Oh my God. Um, not as Chad Vice, but as the Nobody's Radio Station, thanks to the lovely, awesome, talented, unpaid promoter, Marise, she set up a nice TikTok account for the Nobody's Radio Station, Heavy Rock Radio. And we did a little video on that. Uh, finally, I did my first video. Uh, what it is, I don't want to share that because I want you to be surprised by it. I want you to go over to TikTok because I know everybody's on it now. To go over, I want you to go over to TikTok, check it out, and see what you think. It's a fun little skit that we did, and um, I, I can't wait for you to check it out. So there's more content coming on the TikTok uh, Nobody's Radio Station channel, so be sure to check that out. But I don't want to ruin Dave's interview here by talking about TikTok because I'm sure... I'm sure Dave is not on TikTok, and that's a good thing because uh, old school rockers don't need no TikTok. You know what I'm saying? But uh, let's get into my conversation with uh, with Dave. We talk about uh, him joining the band, the uh, trage trage trajectory, the, uh, the the course of the band, um, where it went, what they recorded, uh, the re-release of uh, some songs under the CD called Epitaph. Uh, released by the band's guitarist Chris Harris, who shout out to Chris, who got me in touch with Dave and to start this uh, podcast off. So very thankful for that. Without further ado, my conversation and more with April 16th singer Dave Russell here on Nobody's Radio Station, Heavy Rock Radio or Nobody's or Somebody's Podcast. Chad Vice out. So I don't know uh, when's the last time or how often you talk about your old band, but I'm very curious about it. I'm holding it in my hands right now. You're probably not, but I'm looking at a CD that I got from your former guitarist, uh, Chris Harris. Chris. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. He sent me this uh, CD. He got in touch with me by email offering uh, some songs from the band and then asking to have them played on the radio station. And I'd never heard of the band um, April 16th, so I was curious, <laughs> and he was nice enough to send me a disc. And yeah. uh, I'm really interested to find out about, I guess, the band, what it was. It's no longer active, I'm assuming. So I just no. want to find out uh, who and what April 16th was. Well, um, we we kind of we kind of kicked off right in the middle of um, when all the thrash and the, the hair bands were, were kicking off around sort of mid-80s. I think Metallica had just released Ride the Lightning. Um, and Fraction, you, know, you had the Big Four, Slayer and Megadeth. And on top of that, you had a, a plethora of, of bands who uh, had big hair and big chanty sing-along choruses. Yeah. Um, we were kind of, of a genre that grew up listening to the likes of Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and, um, you know, when they were in their pomp in the sort of mid-early mid 70s. So they kind of reflected in our sound. Um, we we never really had any any great aspirations or you know, no, no real targets. We were just a bunch of guys who got on really well together. That was the thing. We all liked a beer. And um, so, you know, we had about six or seven songs when we finally formed that Chris had written with Lawrence, our other guitarist. Right. And um, I was, the, I was the last member to join. Um, so the guys had already played rehearsed together a few times, but it was, it was what we call in the UK pub rock at the start. Right. That's to say it's music that you would go to a, a, a pub or a bar on a Saturday night and you'd listen to a band doing Leonard Skinner or, you know, ZZ Top, that type of stuff. But we, we, we had all our own material. And um, we soon started getting a bit of a, a local following um, in the area we come from, which is a place called Croydon um, in the county of Surrey in southern England. Um, it's one of uh, London's kind of satellite uh, counties. And... Um, yeah, so we started gigging two or three times a week, uh, not really expecting to pull up any trees or, you know, and before we knew it, we were, we got quite a good following. Our, our gigs at these local venues were, were always well attended. And um, we recorded a demo tape, uh, which we sent off called Cherry Jam, 
which kind of forms some of the basis of the CD you've got there. Um, Epitaph, Chad, it's, there's, yeah. one or, there's one or two songs on there from the Cherry Dam- Jam demo that have been kind of re- remastered, etc. Okay. And um, yeah, and, and, and then sort of 85, 86 came along and the problem was, like I said, we were in competition with a lot of the, the thrash. We weren't thrash metal at all. We were more sort of garagey, kind of rocky type, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, know, we we enjoyed playing live. That was the thing. We were more a live band. Um, yeah, you know, that comes through in the music in the songs I've heard so far. They the, that really comes through the live garage band, the live feel of it. It's very under. It's not overproduced. It's very like just get on, start playing, start rocking pretty, type of pretty feel. Raw, yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. raw. Exactly. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, but um, no, we're not, uh, you know, we kind of, we were together for about six or seven years. We had some kind of minor brushes with um, what you might call fame in inverted commas. Um, we obviously, we made the album called Sleepwalking, um, which was, we all thought, very poorly produced. It was done on a budget um, and that really didn't do us any favours. We appeared on the, on the regional television in London on a program called the six o'clock show which featured uh, somebody you might have heard of a guy called lemmy from motorhead a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah he, <laughs> he, he came and watched us as part of this kind of um you know oh, nice. look at a local scene in london right and, right uh, that was interesting yeah for sure did you know he was there when you well, did we, the show? not initially no yeah. no we we uh we did a we did the interview at chris's house funny enough um the the, the london weekend television crew turned up with all these lights and cameras and producers and whatnot and um they did the they did the interview in chris's front room in his in his living room we all sort of crouched on his settee and stuff and uh then we headed across to a pub called the star in croydon which was our kind of home ground if you like it was our stamping ground and um the guys were the crew were setting all the lights and the equipment up and we were just having a few beers and shooting some pool and blood in walk lemmy um we we like what what's what's this all about you know so he watched us perform gave his opinion which was a positive one um although he did mention that we need to concentrate more on the visual side because we were a bit of a scruffy bunch chad i mean we didn't believe in i I think in actual fact looking at the time we we were we were in our kind of i know 85 86 was when we were busiest um i think we might well have been forerunners of grunge because right uh, with jeans and t-shirt yeah, right versus we, the yeah. outfits the hair the different makeup yeah. the different uh costumes right you weren't uh, putting that flash on a lot of bands exactly. were doing that too yeah. that were like yeah. you mentioned the thrash bands right yeah yeah so yeah. so yeah i mean in those days the mid 80s as you probably know you're probably well aware i mean that the image was was so important to a, yeah. you know a number of bands but to yeah. us we didn't even think about it we just you know the clothes we performed in would it was was the attire that would go to the pub in on a saturday night you know right yeah it exactly was just, it's, it's clear as that really but um but yeah so um yeah we kind of we, we we wound up in 91 um you know because in those days you know we get we weren't paid a lot of money to perform and i think we kind of reached our creative peak potentially after the release of the album we were kind of scratching around for new songs and maybe an identity um and i think we just all realized that it had probably run its course um although we did have a two or three really good songs that aren't on that CD that you've got there, Chad, that uh, we never got round to committing to any kind of recording format. Um, and it was a shame, really. I think we had, we had three or four really decent songs, but um, we never got the chance to record them in any, any way, let alone on, a, on an album or a demo tape. So we've, we've played them live a few times, but um, yeah, that, that was kind of the end of that, really. Sleepwalking, you mentioned that uh, album. Was that the first one? Did you have other ones after that, or was that the only one released besides this no, one? No, that was that that was the only one we had. That was uh, a French record company. Again, um Chris used to Chris kind of managed the band. He hates he kind of hates um, being called a manager of a band because he was an instrumental part in in performance and writing as well. But Chris used to look after all the kind of um the gigs and the bookings and the advertising and the PR and stuff like that. And he he sent uh, demo tapes, the Cherry Jam demo tape, to probably everybody in the world. I think, like they say, most most people have got a copy of Abbey Road. I think they've probably also if they look a bit closer, they've probably got a copy of our demo tape knocking around somewhere. Oh wow. Um and a company in a uh, Black Dragon Records in Paris um, had a subsidiary called High Dragon Records. And uh, there was a lovely lady there called Agnes, Agnes de Grange. Um, she invited us to come up to, to make an album. So we basically had the stuff on Cherry Jan, which we recorded. So it's gone from a demo tape onto an album. Um, 
again on a budget and it was it, you know it came up very muddy which is a kind of classic garage sound i suppose but it yeah. wasn't really the quality was the quality was really um was was lacking so uh yeah it didn't uh, it didn't really do much we we, yeah, we sold a few here and there we actually got to play in france as well because um uh-huh. there's a venue down in lyon um it was called Le Truck. I don't think it's there anymore, but uh, we played there the week, or was it a month after the Happy Mondays had played there and one or two other bands. So it was a well-known well known gig on the French circuit, but, um, you know, that was our one claim to fame of international fame, if you like. We played in France once. <laughs> <laughs>
was there talk of ever doing while you guys were still together as a band before 91 92 was there talk about doing a follow-up record or there was um but like i said we were kind of scratching for ideas because we probably too late realized that we couldn't just keep playing stuff i mean very few bands are, su are successful at regurgitating their style and sound with the pop etc and zz top even i mean even they morphed into some kind of disco rock band with eliminator didn't they yeah and, um, yeah ACDC. Some other bands, I mean, but, you know, with maybe like probably the exce exception to the rule, there are hundreds of hundreds of other bands across Europe and America, I would imagine, guitar-based rock, um, heavily influenced by the 70s, that you can probably go and see most nights of the week, I would imagine. So mm -hmm. um, that was probably, you know, it didn't do us any favours from the outset, really. But, um, you know, we, we, we enjoyed it largely. We You know, we, we had some good fun. Um, a lot of it is documented in a, in a book I've written about it. Um, which is just in the process of being published as we speak. So oh. I'll, I'll, um, I'll send you a copy. Yeah, for sure. Is that uh, your full life story? Is it just the history of the band? What's in it? It's, can you, can you say? Yeah, it's it's kind of a memoir stroke kind of biography. It's kind of, it's it kicks off, you know, I, I, I was so fortunate that I grew up listening to music to me in its heyday in the 60s and 70s. You know, I, I was when I was at school, I was listening to Tamla Motown, the beat was in the kinks, so it's red and all that type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And that, of course, went into the psychedelia of the late 60s. And then, of course, you've got your Zeppelins and your Sabbaths and all the big festivals, the Woodstocks, that type of stuff. Um, and then in the early 70s, you had the arena rock, you know, the prog, prog rock, like, you know, Yes, Genesis, and, you know, even bands like Grand Funk Railroad, and you know, all that kind of stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. So it kind of starts off loosely based around, you know, how it influenced my um, outlook on life, I guess. And then... Um, it progresses through to where I met Lawrence because Lawrence and I met when we were both 15 years old in the first job we ever had. So we're going back to 1971 now oh, wow. when Lawrence and I first met. That, that's how old we are, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, age is just a number. <laughs> of course, of yeah. course, yeah. But Lawrence and I met um, when we worked uh, together in London doing uh, we were delivering telegrams um at oh, this wow. company and, and then uh, we, you know, as you do when you're a teenager, you, you go off and do your own thing. And then we had a completely fortuitous meeting about uh, 13 years later, which resulted in um, Lawrence was the, obviously the guitarist said to me, oh, he's, you know, he was in a band and he's, they're looking for a guy to do some vocals for them. So I went along for an audition thinking nothing of it, thinking nothing would come of it. And we just stalled the five of us got on so well that um, we decided to give it a go. So we did our first gig in 1985. And it was always with John on drums and Eric on bass. It's always been the same lineup as far as when the band existed. That's correct. Yeah, we have, we have we have one or two little little um, not want to say sabbaticals, but uh, I was unavailable for one gig, and the guys went ahead and had somebody somebody replaced me for one gig, and I think uh, one or two other little peripherals might have taken place. But by you know we stuck together through thick and thin. Um, we overcome our, our our shortcomings and differences of opinion, if you like. And uh, yeah, I think. I think we it was it was good, but yeah. So the so the book kind of documents these things. It also documents you know our trips to we played a couple of because um, we really were like a bikers band, like you know most <laughs> most guitar based bands focused on the seventies tend to be. And so we got yeah. invited to play to the All England Hell's Angels Kent Custom Show two years in succession, and then we played at the Milden Hall Festival, which is a big US Air Force base, funny enough, um, mm -hmm. in the south of England. Uh, we were on the same bill as Rory Gallagher and Uriah Heap. Oh well. Wow. Nice. Um, so yeah, and it's 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 one of those stories of um, the book is, is is about abject failure, I believe, rather than uh, how everything goes so swimmingly and everything. And it's got a happy ending, if you pardon the expression. It's um, it's one of kind of toil and the labour of love. And, uh, yeah, just, for sure. How long has the know, process for the book been? When did you start thinking of the idea versus now when it's almost at fruition? Um, well, I, I've always been a keen um, writer of words and stuff. I mean, uh, I. I I've written a few short stories. I did some volunteer work at, at, at a hospital and they had a, they had a, a magazine at this hospital, um, sorry, like a, a three monthly, a quarterly, um, like a pamphlet, leaflet, booklet type thing. And um, they're always looking for people to write short stories in there. So I had volunteered my services one, at one, one time, probably about five years ago now. And I wrote a short story called The House on the Hill. And um, it's kind of a bit like Great Expectations. It's a bit corny, but um, somebody said to me, uh, have you ever considered writing more seriously? You know, and I said, well, not really. Um, and kind of left it at that. And then right at the start of COVID, we were kind of talking about possibly getting back together, kicking around a few ideas. 
but remotely, if you know what I mean. Um, mm. And sadly, uh, Eric, our bass guitarist, passed away right at the start of the COVID outbreak in the oh. UK. Mm, sorry and, um, he was only 55 and someone said oh. to me you know you need to write a book about that old band you was in and i thought well I, so i i had no intention of actually doing it when i started doing it but um after a couple of weeks i had about five thousand words and you know I, I don't know if the same thing happens with you chad you know sometimes you try and think of something and then when you remember something it it links to something else it triggers something else yeah exactly yeah it always, and it's then like you a- speak to somebody path. and you yeah. say do, do you remember that time we and, they, and they'll say yeah and also this happened and you think oh jesus yeah that's, yeah. that's right and yeah, then definitely. before anyway it got to 15 20 000 words and i spoke to chris about it and he said yeah you've got to finish it now so um i've there's just under eighty thousand words in there now and i've got we just sorted the pictures out we've got a publishing i'm going to self-publish mm-hmm. um met a guy um in over near wales a couple of weeks ago who's agree- who's agreed to do it for me so we've agreed a price and um, we've got the colors sorted out we've got you know all the photos the, the writing's finished so um you know i can't uh, i can't wait for it now it's a real i'm really proud of it i really am yeah and it's amazing that you're doing the writing yourself a lot of times these autobiographies or stories they're they're ghost written or they're written they're dictated to somebody and somebody else writes them uh, a, pub, a writer but you're doing it all by your hand by yourself i think that's uh that's a very that's correct important yeah. factor as well too for the books that's very cool yeah yeah so uh, that that um that should be well it will be before christmas so um what i'll that's do is soon. i'll <laughs> I'll, um, if you at some stage you know you have to give me your your address and I'll send you a copy chat. I'd yeah. rather you have a, a physical copy than an electronic copy. It's that's, a bit more romantic. I know. I'm all about uh, physical copies. I love uh, physical media. That's why I enjoyed the CD that Chris sent me. I couldn't believe it. Most people aren't doing that anymore for obvious yeah. reasons because people, for the most part, unfortunately, just don't have time or don't care about the physical product. It's it's a shame, but it's true. So when he sent me this, I was like, wow, that's that's pretty old school. I, I definitely yeah. is attractive for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you've mentioned you're the last person to have joined the band, but do you know um, beforehand, um, was the band name already in place by the time you got there? What's the significance of April 16th? Can you talk to me a little bit about, a little bit about that? Yeah, well, Chris is obviously, Chris was the founder member and um, he, he was jamming around, had a few ideas, you know, this, this is all documented in the book, by the way, but of course I don't mind saying to you, um, yeah, he, he uh, used to write lyrics down. Chris was a, a keen lyricist as well. Before I joined, Chris used to write all the words and most of the music um, with Lawrence. Lawrence was just like an amazing guitarist um, and still is to this day. He still does bits and bobs on, on the internet and, you know, he's fantastic. But um, Chris actually maintains and we've, he, we've, we've, we've kind of tortured him on this over the years and he stands by his explanation of he used to write lyrics down in an old diary, um, you know, which is fine. And he said that... Uh, this particular date, he had some kind of premonition or some kind of hallucinatory. I don't know what drugs he was on at the time, but um, and the date at the top of the page was April sixteenth, and he swears that uh, that's the reason why um, he decided to call the band April sixteenth. And he thought it was an interesting talking point as well, which it was. I think you know, lots of oh, people yeah. say, "Why have you called April 16th? You What's know, we the significance of the date. That, of yeah, exactly. Yeah, what does that mean? Is that the guys? Is, is that the first time you guys started? The first gig? The first record? Like, is it no, someone's no. birthday? You know, there's so many questions that can come from that, right? Yeah, we. I I, I did temp, I did tease him and say, uh, "Was that the date you lost your virginity?" And he, <laughs> he swears. He says. He says, "No, it was. It was. It was in December. That was." <laughs> you never know. How can you check? Is the records probably not? So <laughs> you'll yeah. have to go with that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But um, he, we 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 were interviewed. Um, Chris and I went on an overnight train from London up to Scotland, up to Aberdeen, to um, a Scottish radio station called Radio North Sound, and uh, they did a little interview us on us, and they and they they did the same thing why are you called april 16th and they didn't really believe us and i said to chris there's something more than this on the train back we were both roaring drunk by the way we'd both been drinking all day and we were drink- drinking on the train coming back and uh he proffered an- another explanation of of why it's called april 16th but i you can- like i said in the book friendship and uh, diplomacy prevents me from revealing i'm, sh- I'm sure it- the only way you're going to find out is to get chris drunk and hope he tells you the same story that he told me well, we'll try it out. We'll see if we get him on an interview. We'll get him drunk first. I'll send some. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's got beer in the house. It's a long far. It's a little bit far to send it from me, but uh, if he's got some yeah. beer in the house, we'll see. <laughs> no, it's yeah. very cool. You're yeah. right. It's a talking point for sure because people are going to ask that, and it's going to gain interest. It's not a band name. Every band name is is something, but there's always when you have a, a band name that has a talking point or something that gets more questions. That's always that seems to be like it must be a plus, and I don't think it hurts you too much, or maybe 
if you can say, I don't think people misunderstood it or I don't think it hurt the band in any way, do you think? No, I, I don't think it did. I mean, it, it, if anything, it didn't categorize us or pigeonhole us. I mean, you know, you see some bands names and straight away, you know, what sort of music they're playing. Um, yeah, it's not Metal it's, Lords or Metal yeah, something or whatever. It, you know what I mean? It doesn't tell you exactly what it is. It's April 16th. It could be anything, really. Exactly. Which, and, yeah, yeah. Um, we, I mean, we never, we never really played on that. I mean, we, you know, it was just, it's just one of those curios. I think that, um, you know, maybe it helped us along the way because people, it did draw people in because they were so, like you say, you're quite right. You know, this is an interesting name for a band. Let's go check them out. So, um, mm -hmm. I yeah. guess that kind of uh, was a double edged sword, I suppose. Yeah. I'm curious where it started for you as far as singing goes. You mentioned your um, your influences in the bands and the artists you were listening to growing up, but where did you realize, where did it start for you that you realized you could sing, that you wanted to sing, that you could do professionally, your voice, where, where does it come from? Where did it all start for you? Well, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm flattered that you think that. It's a very nice thing for you to say, Chad. I appreciate that. But um, I suppose we're all our own fiercest critics, aren't we? But for me, um, I grew up, um, like I said, watching and listening to all these bands. And I, I went to see bands live and I was just knocked over by the, the sheer spectacle. And I guess um, the first real influence on me as a vocalist was a guy called Paul Rogers, um, mm. you may have heard of. Yeah. Um, a little he was bad in a company, Laurel Free. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Stuff, um, little queen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, that, we'll forgive yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yes, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a graduation of how things turn out, isn't it, really? But yeah, I, I listened to the early Free stuff, off the, especially the Fire and Water album. Um, mm. And like that, obviously that was a, that was the album that All Right Now was on the yeah. long version, yeah. and um, I just I was listening to some of this music and I gravi gravitated towards vocalists of that ilk. Um, so kind of bluesy raw guitarists. I mean David, Co sorry vocalists. Uh, David Coverdale was probably another one. 
Um, and a guy who used to play in a band, uh, there's a guy called Robin Trower. I don't yes. know if, if you've yep, heard of Robin Trower. Yep. His first two or three albums featured a Scottish guy called James Dewar. And he has got the most beautiful, honey-rich voice. Um, and that's the kind of, I wanted to sound like that. But weirdly, people like Robert Plant were, you know, and Geddy Lee and, and Ozzy and Gillen were the, were the vocalists I kind of looked up to from a technique point of view. For sheer feel, um, it was those guys who tended to be in the baritones at the lower register um, category. And I, I think um, I listened to vocalists like Nat King Cole and, and guys like that, you know, and some of the old the old crooners from the 60s and the, and the 50s. Right, and think right. you know, they've got so much, you know, this is the Frank Sinatra singing sometimes. And it's wonderful just to hear it just comes so naturally, you know. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, I, I was never one of these guys who could sing like Rob Halford or you know up with a you know like an the upper huge register. screams the big uh, the big yeah the big falsetto yeah were you singing yeah. along to these records I'm assuming when you said Coverdale you're you're talking about his Deep Purple era but uh, yeah but uh, were you finding yourself singing along to them Did someone yeah. say to you Hey you got a good voice You should try to get some You should try to do something What happened next Yeah well kind of I I, I, had, I had a couple of auditions for bands before um, April 16th came along and. Um, they kind of didn't really go anywhere because we were just doing cover versions. And I, ne I never really wanted to do cover versions, which was one of the pluses about joining April 16th because it was all original material. I think, um, I, I know a lot of people may agree with this, but I think once you start doing cover versions, your fates, you, you, you're, you're destined for failure, I think, because you, you know, you're just caricatures, aren't you? You've got to be, you've got to want more, I think. Not to say that there's anything wrong with covers bands, but, you know, um, Whenever I go and see a cover band, I'm always disappointed. And I say, right, that's it. I'm never going to see another covers band, you know, until the next one comes along, of course. And um, so, yeah, I, I just, one or two people said you should try it. And I, I quite a bold personality, even though I'm really shy underneath. I'm quite introvert. I'm not a great socializer. But um, I, like most people like that, um, I, I don't mind a bit of attention, <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially uh, you know, if, if you've had a couple of drinks and you can. Yeah. Uh, that, the courage comes up a bit. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, it might be false praise. I don't know, but it makes you feel good when you're when you're. There's nothing like. Uh, have you ever been in a band? No, I have no musical talent whatsoever. I'm barely getting through just talking on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've this, always uh, wanted to, but I've never had uh, never had the opportunity to to play an instrument or something. Doesn't mean I can't. You never too. It's never too late to learn, obviously. But it's never come up. I enjoy music so much, but never been behind it, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's um. It, it, it's an interesting paradox, like I say, you know, between being a, an introvert and slightly shy and self-conscious to um, mm -hmm. standing in front of a rock band in a field full of Hell's Angels. Um, yeah. It's it's quite a good leveller, you know. Uh, but then sometimes we, we need a bit of encouragement in our lives. I think sometimes if you tell people they're rubbish long enough, they'll actually believe they're rubbish. But, you know, yeah. all the time we were getting positive reviews. We had some negatives, of course. All band gets, bands get negative reviews. You know, all the time we were getting positive feedback and people were coming to see us. Um, you know, we used to play gigs all over London and we used to take a coach party with us, like, you know, sort of 30, 40, 50 people sometimes from our local area would pile this coach and come come to the venues around London and the home counties in, in the, the south of England and a, particularly a place called Bogies in Cardiff, which was a, a big metal venue. And uh, they used to come and watch us and, you know, they all they all just used to like, like hanging with us and having a beer and, and they go mad when we played and... You know, it, it kind of builds your confidence up a little bit. You mentioned something before I thought was uh, kind of interesting as well, too, as far as the you guys doing original music. And a lot of those pub bands, a lot of bands, especially in that era, were playing covers because that was the way to, from what I'm told, quote unquote, make money because there was no money in original music. If, if you got up there and people didn't know your songs, the, the club wouldn't book you back or the bar wouldn't book you back because no one would come. They want to yeah. hear songs they're familiar with. So yeah. there's a big business in, in cover bands doing that thing. So if you think about it, you guys doing originals, getting up on stage, doing songs that people hadn't heard maybe the first time and don't have a connection to. That's kind of, if you will, ballsy a bit and kind of a little bit hard to get through sometimes. Did you have any pushback from the clubs you played in or the bars or anybody saying that, no, we want covers, we don't, we want you to play stuff that people know? Or was it just going over well? We, we had none of that whatsoever, Chad. I think we were quite lucky because, you know, our songs were, were, were up, they were pretty good. I mean, some of them were kind of blues standards. We, you know, She's Mean and Don't Drink were kind of blues blues based yeah. you can't really go yeah. wrong with those two of my favorites on the record yeah and don't drink you know when we used to play that live you know the people standing at the bar would just come into the hall at the back just to just a headbang because it was just one of those songs you can't go wrong with you know yeah. and um even though it, it you know it, it tipped the nod towards um you know blues bands of the past it was still we made it our own and 
you know, we were we were kind of blues based, but no, we never. To answer your original question, Chad, um, no, we we never we never had any pushback whatsoever. And the great thing about that was also a little forever now cap was we played at these festivals, and as you probably know, at bike festivals, a lot of the bands do a lot of covers. When we mm. we had a, a Jimi Hendrix ZZ Top cover band on after us once at Milden Hall, a band called the Hamsters. And, um, and for the first two songs, you think, God, they sound just like Hendrix. But after four or five songs, you've kind of lost interest because, you know, it's not it's not Hendrix. It's, it's not Hendrix. It's not the band. You, you have a connection to those songs, but you know it's not him. It's not the band playing. So you kind of lose it a bit. It's, it, doesn't, it's, it takes you out of it. It's not the same feeling or the same no, emotion. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and by the same token, I went to see a Led Zeppelin tribute act in uh, uh, Norwich is the There's city I live in, in, uh, yeah. in, in East England, a band called whole lot. Of, well, sorry, I won't, I won't give you their name. Um, <laughs> but they were, uh, they were uh, a Led Zeppelin tribute act. And a mate of mine contacted me and said that one of his brothers has got COVID and he's got a spare ticket for this gig for this Led Zeppelin tribute act. Do you want to come along? And I'm a massive Zeppelin fan. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to see him several times in the seventies. And um, the massive, original massive band, I, I yeah, the original, the original band. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw him. I saw him at Old Court in '75, and I've still got the T-shirt, by the way. Amazing. And um, went along to see this band, and you know, and, and even Kashmir, it was it, it wasn't a Led Zeppelin. Tri- it was like a, a covers band. It was like a bunch of musicians playing a Led Zeppelin song, song instead of people who sound like Led Zeppelin playing Led Zeppelin right, songs. Right, because there's a lot. I mean, Led Zeppelin bands like that, there's a, there's so many tribute bands. Rush, there's so many bands doing it, especially the popular bands. There's a million tributes out there. Kiss, there's all kinds of stuff, right? There's some that can do it really well. When you If you close your eyes, you think you're listening to Robert Plant or to, to somebody. But if you're otherwise, for the most part, a lot of those bands, you're just hearing a band do, for the lack of a better term, karaoke. You know, yeah, it's, it's exactly. there's so much out there. It's hard to find something that's good because if you're so good, if you're too good, you're copying. If you're not good, you're just, you're ruining it. It's, it's a really, it's a tough thing doing covers, especially you know, for a huge band, covering a huge band. Yeah. There's yeah. no win yeah. almost. Yeah. And there's, and there's that, that uh, famous old adage, isn't there? That um, how many, how many cover versions can you say are better than the original? Yeah. And I, I can't, I can think of maybe one or two. Not There's a few there, that are really right. good, but it depends on yeah. how, su- how successful the original song was, who, where the band yeah. was successful. Was it a regional band? Was it in America? Was it over in, in the UK? Where was it? What's your connection to it? There's so many factors too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. So when the band finally, what was there one certain thing that you guys decided, that, okay, it's time to hang this up. We're not going where we thought we were. Was there one specific incident? Was it something brewing over time? When did the band officially end and what was kind of the catalyst for that, can you say? Well, um, we used to play, you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, Chad, you know, that we were playing a lot of places where you, you had to pay to play. Um, right. So you'd, you'd have to hire a PA. So you get this, that we hired PAs that would cost, doesn't sound a lot now, but we're talking nearly 40 years ago, yeah. 80, 90 quid um, to hire a PA company for, for six to eight hours because obviously they've got to leave where they, where they work. They've got to come in, set up, yeah do the mixing and then dismantle and take everything away when you finish so they weren't just there for the duration of the performance so you had to book these guys for almost a day really and uh, i know um chris won't mind me saying this but he was chris was paying a lot of this out of his own pocket and i think we kind of took him for granted quite a bit but even so towards the end we did start to make a little bit of money which kind of covered those costs but um we got to the point where uh, i think we all just kind of knew it just felt no, I didn't, no one complained let's put it that way Chris said look, he, that he was really struggling with you know financially supporting the band right and we all understood that none of us we were all just kind of working regular working guys we couldn't really afford to carry on hiring these expensive PAs and paying for advertising um which Chris was doing with a little help from the you know the money we were making if we did make any money there was no um, record label there was no record label support like big exactly. bands have. there's no, no videos obviously on MTV or anything out there or MTV yeah. plus out there yeah no it's it's unfortunate yeah. you don't have that backing think, right yeah yeah exactly and I think that coupled with the fact that the second album wasn't really forthcoming we we hadn't heard anything from High Dragon Records just to to indicate that they'd be prepared to put some money behind us to record a second album and the fact that the traveling was becoming to be a bit, a little bit of a chore, um, new ideas were kind of, you know, we had bits and pieces, but we were kind of losing a little bit of the motivation to do it. I believe that's, that's, it's easy for me to say, I don't know how the other guys felt about it, but, but the thing was when the April 16th split, we all went on to form other bands with, uh, other different bits and pieces, but none of them came together with the success that April had, you know, we had, uh, uh John, the drummer, Eric, the bassist and I, we recruited a good, another guitarist and uh, 
we went under the name of Ramp. We only did one gig, um, doing some old April stuff. And then I moved uh, to Norfolk, um, which is about 150 miles away from London. So that was me out of the picture. Mm. Those guys carried on for a while, but again, they recorded a, um, a cassette tape as it was. It was in those days. Um, Chris and Lawrence went on to, f- to form a band called Matrix, um, which I think could have been successful, but it, the uh, participants were very um, erratic in their performance and attendance. You know, they mm. you, it, you can't you've got to you've got to apply yourself when you want to try and do something, as you probably know with, with the job you do, Chad. You can't just go off half cocked. You've no. got to be committed Focused. to it. Yeah, exactly. Dedicated. So, focus. Um, yep. yep. And in the meantime, Chris and I have been in touch with each other and we, we, you know, we're looking at doing something. We've got a few ideas, reworking some old stuff that we've got um, for audacity, which is what we'll be doing as soon as I've got the book out and about um, just to try and, but again, as we, as we did when we kicked taper off, we're not looking to make any money. We're not looking to, you know, go on, go on TV and stuff like that. It's just purely indulging a passion that we've got. And that is to, to make music. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how that develops. And if we do make anything, Chad, you'll be the first one to receive a copy of it. I appreciate that so much. I was that was going to be one of my questions too. Are there plans? I know we've lost uh, Eric, as you mentioned, but were there plans to have um, more music come from you guys, more shows? Were you guys going to reform at some point? It's been like you said, almost forty years now since the beginning. Yeah. Do you feel like there's still music in you guys that you want to write and record? You still feel like singing, singing old stuff, that kind of thing, or gigging if you can. Do you have plans for that? I think, um, as you know yourself, you know, music continues to. uh, evolve and develop and the music i listen to these days i never thought for one second i'd be listening to back in the day i mean i'm heavily into um this this sound that's coming out of new orleans lately um well i say lately you know bands like crowbar and i hate god oh um, yes yeah, bands great. Like that, uh, the real doomy heavy stuff yeah, exactly I love it. Um, like where down comes from that's uh, pantera exactly, singers yeah. yeah old band or current band old current it's hard to say they're back and forth but that whole louisiana sound is very it's great it's, it's some great sludge metal it's got some really cool sounds yeah yeah so i kind yeah. of slowed slowed down down yeah. tune stuff i mean Frozen, I, I conformity still... yeah some great great bands yeah great artists oh yeah there. yeah I love yeah, it. yeah so I, do you I feel still... yourself bringing that kind of influence not not maybe directly, but do you feel like some of that influence would come into new music or new singing or if you did new songs together? Do you think that would yeah, kind of seep in? Definitely, yeah. We, we've already earmarked a couple of old songs that we used to do. Um, there's one song we used to do called Rattlesnake Shakedown, which it was always a killer live, but it always sounds messy when it, when it was recorded, but live it used to send everyone a bit, everybody crazy. I mean, um, and that was just like a quick, a quick um, boogie shuffle type song. But um, I said to Chris, you know, if you take those chords and slow them down and down tune them, they sound absolutely incredible. You know, big yeah. fat sludgy riffs. <laughs> yeah, nice. And I think I think I'd resist the temptation to do like these uh, these death vocals over the top. I wonder what it would sound like with a clean vocal on it. You know. Um, yeah. So for we'll, sure. we'll, we'll we'll give it a try and see how it goes. Speaking of vocal, how has your voice been holding up uh, in in these years? Have you done a lot of singing in the years in the two thousands and in the nineties since the breakup? Have you? Uh, how's the voice? How are things? I know things change as you get older, especially for a vocalist. Um, being honest, yeah. how, how are things for you? How is your voice? How do you feel about it? Take- it's still it's still in it's still in good shape. I I I, uh, I stopped smoking and um, I used to smoke quite a lot. Um, I stopped smoking and I still I've I've good breathing techniques and stuff like that, but. Um, I haven't really performed live or in any kind of similar context since the band broke up. However, when I'm in the car and I've got music on and I've got the windows wound up and I'm driving along the the motorway or whatever, Mm. I do try and sort of match what I'm listening to. Um, Again, with varying degrees of success, but uh, there's still something. And I think, you know, as long as you've got the the, the desire to do something, sometimes that can be enough. You know, it's it's great having it for people who've got bags of talent. I wouldn't know, but... um, if, as long as you've got the desire and the inkling to, to to put something together, I think sometimes that can be all you need, with a little bit of luck and a little bit of talent on top. You yeah, know, if you've got a bit, a bit of fire in your belly, as they say. Yeah, uh, you mentioned you and Chris, but is is John going to be back? Is Lawrence going to be back as yeah. well to work on this? Everybody that's that's still yeah. that's still with us. Yeah, yeah. John John would still. I know John would definitely be up for it. Um, he's often posting things on Facebook about when we're getting back together, and you know why is it taking so bloody long? That type of thing. <laughs> and Lawrence. Um, Lawrence has actually, well, John, John recorded something to put it on Facebook. Uh, I think it was something to do with when COVID started. He, he just like played, he was outside his house 
and he got his, a, a drum kit that's set up outside his house and he just kept, he just played a beat like a straightforward you know, did, 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 did beat kind of thing rattling around a little bit mm. and um, because we're all still friends on Facebook Lawrence got Lawrence heard it and then decided to put a guitar track over the top of it and it, and it sounded fantastic you know and it's nice. just it's just one of those little reminders to think come on guys let's 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 do something again let's at least try it like, there's nothing worse than you know you've got to try haven't you Exactly. Yeah, because that's the thing too. I mentioned you about the vocals, but the other thing too is is drummers, especially when the age two can have a, diff a difficult time as well too. So to hear that John still has the chops as well, which it's it's fantastic yeah. to hear that too. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, we, it's always the hardest on the drummer and the singer is is what I find as far as in well, the years, yeah. I mean, we'll say. <laughs> it's it's a great point you make. I just finished reading Neil Peart's uh, autobiography mm -hmm. and uh, about the illness when he had to pack, stop playing with Rush, you know, and. Yeah. that type of thing and uh, again obviously the guy who played for Genesis Phil Collins I mean he had a similar kind of thing when you're pounding the tubs all those times it's going to have some kind of impact I'm sure but, um, oh yeah because look at Phil but, Phil doesn't drum anymore now if you saw or heard about the tour he did with Genesis yeah. he's, in a, he's sitting down I mean he still sounds great physically but he can't he can barely walk he definitely can't know, play man. drums it's unfortunate yeah. it's hard on drummers man the feet the arms the legs the wrists yeah. there's so, the, so, yeah. the shoulders it's, it's yeah. crazy it's crazy yeah yeah, but uh, no, we'd, I'm sure we'd be up for that. I'm sure we can persuade Lawrence. I he'd probably be the most elusive and the most difficult to uh, to persuade. But, um, you know, if we present him with something and say, hi, man, what do you think of this? I know he'd put something over the top of it for sure. No, that's good to hear. Uh, before I uh, before I let you go, talk to me about the CD that I am holding or have here beside me, the uh, Epitaph CD. Uh, this put together by Chris, I assume, with uh, yeah. the songs that were on the Sleepwalking record and songs that came around it too. But can you talk about... Uh, releasing it it says 1999 on that was that about around the time it came out what was the kind of the purpose for it if you will uh we we um we actually had i'm not quite sure what i think 1999 was when chris put uh i, I might be wrong i don't i don't want to i don't want to say anything really because i might be mistaken but um the the original master tapes from the recording of the album um were still available to us and lawrence and chris who are, are kind of digital wizards they like playing with that sort of thing decided um probably what three years two two three years ago now to uh to get it remastered and repressed and issue, and issue it as a cd so it, it really is just a just um you know a brushed up version of what we've done before but in, in a more current format if you like um it sounds and, amazing the songs sound great on it it's great i love the, well, if, the production yeah, on yeah, it yeah. especially when you've you listen to the vinyl and then listen to that. The difference is astonishing. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, the, the original vinyl versus the CD. Uh, I love vinyl, but uh, yeah. even the original vinyls, but I can imagine the sound uh, difference. Did, did he go in? Obviously, he remastered it. He went into a studio and did some work with it, I guess, to kind of yep, prep, to, exactly. to push up a bit. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so Epitaph, the name of the CD, do you feel like the songs, the, the CD is a good epitaph for that, at least that era of the band, that original run? Do you feel like it's a good representation of it? Yeah, definitely, because um, it captures a couple of songs that aren't available elsewhere. Um, there's a there's a song on there called Midday Man, which is one of the yeah, I love that one too. So that that um, if you next time you listen to that, Chad, that that riff right at the end, when we used to play that live, people used to the guys used to just headbang like demons because oh, it's just a imagine. rumbling yeah, heavy yeah. with two two guitars and the bass, and it was it was a you know just a throbbing pulsating you know, wonderful maelstrom of, of wonderfulness. Were you up there headbanging as well too, rocking that, uh, I assume, oh, the long hair at the time. <laughs> as yeah, a fellow bald yeah. man, I can say we missed those days. Well, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thing the thing was, um, you know, for the first couple of years when I joined the band, I, I was starting to lose my hair. And, I, and people would say to me, you look a lot like Mick Fleetwood and, or Jeff, <laughs> or Jeff, you know, uh, Ian Anderson off Jeff Rotol, you know, so. Talented um, men. After exactly yeah, after a couple of years, I decided to shave shave it off. And um, the funny oh, during the heyday of the band, you were also rocking the bald look as well too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. When it comes on to, the CD, yeah, I think it, in the picture of the I don't know. Do you know where the where the live shot is from? That's not, I don't know if you're you probably haven't looked in a while. There's a live shot of you guys. Yeah. In the, do you know where yeah. it's from? That's the Kent Custom Bike Show. Okay, wow. It's that's one of the cool uh, that's one of the Hell's Angels festivals. We oh biked. wow, very cool. Um. Yeah, there's some interesting stories. I've, I've written some interesting, uh, one or two interesting things that happened at, at those festivals that I've documented in the book. That uh, and, e and even one that I, I didn't mention in the book when Chris said that um, the, the angels used to settle up in cash. There was no checks or anything or bank right. transfers in those days. Yeah. But Chris said that um, we hadn't been paid yet. You know, we'd, we'd done our set and uh, 
Chris decided to tie, he must have a pair of balls like in Rhino because <laughs> he went backstage to where the angels, because they were stewards, they were security, they were, you know, the complaints department, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You had to go and see one of the angels. Anyway, Chris yeah. went to this little shed backstage to say, uh, well, hi, man, like, where do we get paid, please, if you don't mind? And uh, he said, one of the guys had a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and they, he said he paid it. He paid us in cash. He just counted it out like you do. You, you lick your thumb and you yeah. and put the money on the on the table for us. And Chris said, "Like thank you very much." Walked out backwards, like nodding his head. Thank you, thank you. Like it would be royalty. Yeah, don't turn your back. Um, At least you got yeah, paid. I think it's it's it is a good representation, Chad. Yeah, to get back to you because it kind of it covers from the first song to the last song almost. I mean, the, the only songs that aren't on there, like I mentioned before. There were three or four, three or four songs that we had ready ready for any pr- prospective second album. So um, there was a song called Madagascar, uh, a song called Ramp, a song called Dark House. Um, Second Sight was another one. That's four songs I can think of that we used to play live towards the end that aren't recorded anywhere. So, um, you know, that that would, that would have been the backbone of the uh, of any, any second album. But the, the actual discography, if you like, goes from the first songs, like Illusion, She's Mean, Don't Drink, um, right up to sleepwalking and um, uh, looking for love was another one on there. I think that's the last. The it's last the last song, song yeah. So I guess it goes chronologically, like kind of like a greatest hits record. Then basically from the start of the career to what would be quote unquote the end of it. Yeah, yeah. pretty much, mate. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So, and one more thing I want to ask you too about the the live shows, the touring. So you you played a lot, of course, in Europe, the UK. You mentioned you went to France once, but I guess America, North America, you never got really as far as over here at that point, correct? No, no. There's there's no way we could have made it over there, Chad. We just didn't have the finances at the time. Right. And the record company was just a small independent record company. You know, they weren't uh, they were a subsidiary of a of a more major company. Like I say, they were based in they were based in Paris. The um the company the main company was called Black Dragon and their subsidiary was called High Dragon so they just they just swept up the bits that the main company didn't want really you know mm. not quite good enough to be put in the bargain bin but um so yeah they 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 wouldn't have um, I don't think they would have underwritten anything like an undertaking like that a lot of a lot of British bands uh, have different opinions about this but did you have aspirations to play over in America or were you happy playing in the area you, you were in as far as getting your British audience. I think we, yeah, I think we we would have been up for a for a journey anywhere. To be honest with you, I mean, we, you know, that was the nature of our personalities. We were just let's just go and have a laugh, you know. Let's uh, mm-hmm. France, yeah, okay, man. We'll just we'll take we'll, we we took our old um, transport a van, an old Bedford van we took with us, and a car. We crammed everything into those two vehicles: the drum kit, the back line, the guitars, you know, all the booze and the food and the change mm-hmm. of underwear into these two these two vehicles and it was 40 degrees of heat and um we traveled down to the south of france and, and we would have been we would have had the same appetite i think um if somebody was prepared to put a bit of money behind us to to go wherever they wanted us to go really because we just enjoyed playing live you know rehearsals were, were, were a bit of a chore we we just loved playing live wherever there was like 10 people there or or 500 people there you know right. that was what we wanted to do that was where we all got our kicks but the funny thing was you meet all of us individually and we're all very quiet, softly spoken, gentle guys. I mean, we weren't crazy screaming, you know, partying, drug taking, whatever. Hmm. You know, we like nothing more than sitting down and having a, shooting some pool, having a few beers and just, you know, watching the world go by, really. And uh, a couple of times we'd be, oh, shit, shouldn't we be on stage now? Come on, quick, you know, let's finish. <laughs> you guys are sitting <laughs> at the bar and inside, you guys need to move your, get yourself up on stage. They had to move you up to the stage because <laughs> you're oh. busy at the bar. <laughs> Just exactly, hanging out, yeah. hanging out like regular folk, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. No, that's very, very cool. So I'm looking forward to, obviously, you got the book coming out. You have a lot going on. I'm very happy to uh, hear about that as well, too. What yeah. is beyond the book, beyond the new music, as far as you mentioned some, maybe if you can do some shows as well, but what is, is there is there a plan as far as the band goes, as far as where you want to take it any further? Do you feel it's like a hobby at this point, or do you feel yourself you could do it almost like a part time or full time? Where do you see it going towards moving? I along? think yeah, the, the, the logistics may be a problem. You know, the ge- geography of where I mean, I'm 150 miles from London. Um, I know the I, we don't. Although we're still in contact with each other on Facebook on Messenger, we don't actually. 
physically see each other anymore, if you know what I mean. Um, You're all in different parts of the of the country. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which which is a huge shame. We've all we've all got on with our lives since. I can't believe we're 35, 40 years has gone since we. Well, I think when did we split up? Ninety one. So you're looking at thirty. Just over thirty two years. Thirty two. Thirty one years. Yeah. Thirty two yeah. years. Yeah. So what I mean, what I'd like to do, like I said, is once once the book's out and we've got everything sorted out and that's all good to go, I I'm, I intend to hook up with Chris and maybe get some ideas together. And if it comes to nothing, it comes to nothing. But like I said to you earlier, Chad, you know, you at least you've got to try. You can, it's better to regret something you've done than something you haven't done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know we we'll give it a try. And if it's not working out, I don't think any of us has got the patience or the wherewithal to say, "No, come on, man, let's keep going." You know, to push it, it further be... than it needs to go, or if you feel like you can, you're not going to push it where it doesn't, where it gets to no. be too much. Yeah. The exactly. benefit of the benefit of thirty years later too is that now you really, in a lot of bands, you don't need a big record label, you don't need a big backing. You can release a, a single on YouTube. You can put your music out there on, on the on the streaming apps. You can put a video. You can shoot a video if you wanted just by using this, using your phone. You could do a lot of things that you would normally have to get paid a big budget for from a record label t- uh, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. That, that, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse because now anybody can do that. But then again, anybody can do that. You can kind of get lost in the mix. But for a band like April 16th and you guys, if you have something and you feel strongly about it, you can just get it out there to the people who who would have interest or, or other people or other fans. And it's yeah. so much easier to get your music out there now. So if you had an idea, it's it's really it's convenient. You can get it out there and people can check it out. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, Chris has Chris um, reworked uh, two or three of our old songs. He's, he's actually put a video. He's put a video together of certain. I mean, one was uh, there was Clap on Wood um sleepwalking yeah. yeah. and illusion those three songs he's he's messed about with some some video um images that he's got and um he's put the songs put the song and the, and the, and the video together and he's he stuck them on facebook on there we've got an april 16th appreciation society page yes or app sock as we call it and um he's put a couple of bits on there so um you know he's i think he, even after all this time chris is still wishing to do something i know he is i can tell just from the dialogue that we have uh, on messenger um you know even oh, even sure. even messaged yeah. me tonight about f- 10 minutes before we were due to chat uh, you and i chat and he said uh, hope it goes well you know so um he's like is this conversation yeah. with you guys ever going to happen <laughs> 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 i brought yeah. him to your attention a few months ago what's happening come on <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a bit of a hold up yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but um, you're right about that with Chris, though. He is really promoting. Like, I mean, like I said, that's how I got that's how April 16th got on my radar was he sent an email to the radio station uh, email with uh, with links to the band. And 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 we got to chatting and then he sent the CD. So he's he's still out there pushing it. He still has a, a passion oh, big time. to get it yeah. to get the music out there for sure. That hasn't changed clear, clearly. No, in no. Years. He, yeah. um, he 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 contacted me about uh, six weeks ago and he said, um. Dave, there's a there's a Spanish record com- a Spanish radio station. They want uh, you or one of us or you, he said, um, <laughs> to do some kind of voiceover to introduce one of our songs. He said, and also while you're doing it, would you mind saying the name of the of the radio station? So um, I'm going to ask I, you. I, I had too. a chance to listen. <laughs> I had a chance to listen to um, one or two examples of what other guys have put on there. And again, as you can imagine, it's just screaming histrionics, you know. And I just said, oh, "Hi, man, it's Dave here from London Rockers UK 16. If you're listening to Temple of Rock, you know that's perfect. That's all. I, that's all I would ask for. That's all you should ask for. People can do their own style. People do what works for them. As far as when when you ask for radio IDs, I think they should do it in the style that they're known for, yeah. for lack of a better yeah. term. You know what I mean? You're not a screaming you, guy, as we mentioned. So you're not going to go. Ah! You're not going to whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be Dave. Like who the hell? That's not is that Dave. But some no. of them do. <laughs> some exactly. some of them have, like they listen, have to. Yeah. Yeah. I listen back to some of them and that's what they do. Yeah, you know? They feel they have to. They, they put on a radio voice. They think they're a radio DJ or they have to. And it's like, no, no, stick with your style. It's all good. Even just say your name. It's the name. And people, hey, it's Dave Russell from April 6th. That's perfect. Yeah. That's all yeah. you need. Yeah. And that's all they need to know, isn't it? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's just a nice little caveat, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Dave, I look forward to uh, talking to you again. I want to talk to you when the book comes out, obviously, because I want to dig deep into the whole process for that. We could have got into that here, but I want to save it for another time because we can talk about the genesis of it, the, the time, everything. There's stuff around the book we can talk about. I'd love sure. to have your conversation when that happens too and and uh, stay and stay in touch as well. 
Okay, mate. Yeah, that's that's great. That's great. It's for been sure. a pleasure speaking with you, Chad. Yeah, for for sure, for uh, for you too. And I definitely look to hearing more. I can't wait to hear more music if it comes out. In the meantime, I'm going to keep rocking to this. I encourage people to to check it out. Go visit the uh, April sixteenth Appreciation Society Facebook group. Anybody can join. Check it out. And um, yeah, we'll we'll keep in touch, Dave. And I look forward to uh, hearing more. Okay, Chad. You look after yourself, mate. Yeah, you too. Take care, Dave. Talk okay, to you. buddy. Cheers. Bye bye. 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 You've been listening to another Nobody's Radio Station exclusive presentation.